Thank you, everybody. Great to see you this afternoon. A uh, little uh, snow at the beginning of our day, and we're watching uh, all of the weather uh, news for the remainder of this week very carefully, but delighted that you can spend some time with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, and I want to thank Beth in advance, because I usually forget, for helping to uh, moderate this. And I also want to thank uh, Angela Richardson, if you'll see her in a square as uh, we get close to Donna Corbin's retirement. Angela will be stepping in as the executive assistant to the president, and she is uh, doing a little bit of overlap time uh, before Donna retires at the end of March. Uh, and so uh, Angela has really been working hard to get up to speed uh, with uh, all of the challenges of working with me, uh, and there are plenty with that. Uh, today's conversation was inspired by an opportunity uh, that happens annually through the Association of Community College Trustees, and that is an opportunity for us to advocate for, at the federal level, about some key priorities for community colleges and tell you more about sort of how this transpires, but I uh, really want to share with you a couple of photos here. We spent some time with uh, Congressman Moulton in his office. We also had a chance to speak with uh, Congresswoman Trehan while we were in her office. Uh, we also had a chance to uh, visit with them informally in the next slide that shows you that we were able to talk about some key priorities, both for the community college and in general, but also for Middlesex Community College, specifically the work that's been done around some of our new academic programs, uh, the Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Center, uh, our uh, Office of uh, Essential Needs for our students, uh, lots of varied topics. Uh, and next slide, you'll also get a chance that we got to see Senator Markey too. Uh, we were there, we met with the entire delegation. Uh, we had also uh, an opportunity to meet with uh, Senator Warren uh, in that time as well. So these are just some photos of that trip. And I wanna thank uh, Chairman Jim Campbell uh, and Trustee Cheryl Howard, who were with us and thank Patrick Cook for his assistance in sort of setting up our meetings and working with uh, our folks here in Massachusetts to make sure that it was a very, very productive conversation. Um, and the Association of Community College Trustees does this annually, bringing presidents uh, and representatives from the trustees to talk to their legislators directly on the Hill. We happened to be there on the day of President Biden's uh, State of the Union address, uh, which comes with its own sort of uh, uh, contradictions and challenges on that last day when we were trying to navigate through many of the offices when they were starting to shut things down for security purposes on that last day that we were there. This is a couple of weeks ago. But today is really an opportunity to talk with all of you about some of those priorities and to mention to you the fact that uh, although it is a key responsibility of the president to really be able to articulate priorities for the college and for our students, those priorities at the federal level and at the state level that will be most impactful, part of our theme for today is to talk about how you can be informed and how you can serve as advocates. There are over 93 people on this Zoom uh, if you were to take time to engage in something we're going to talk about later calling Advocacy Day or making a phone call uh, to your representatives, both at the federal and at the state level, um, how that can transform our voice at a critical time, not only in this country, but also in this state. Uh, and at the country, as you know, we are not at a time where uh, friends who folks who are friendly to higher education are in power within Congress. And so we have to work very carefully to make sure that the priorities that we've identified that are going to help our students are really going to be most impactful to them and that are all of those folks. And I would say that uh, all of our delegation are incredibly supportive of the community college and the service, that, the students that we serve. But I want to make sure that you have some familiarity with those priorities uh, and that you can actually make sure that uh, if you want to make a phone call, if you want to write a letter, there's some things that are really gonna make a difference for uh, what we're doing here at Middlesex to better serve our students that ratchets up to the federal level. So first I'm gonna do a little 
uh, overview of some of our legislative priorities at the federal level. These are the conversations and talking points that we spent time with our folks in DC and their staffers about what's most important to us and why. So let me give you a little explanation of each of those. Then I'm gonna do that with our state level. Uh, and then we're gonna make some announcements and some discussion about advocacy day. And then we will open it up to your questions. So a number of these categories for the community college federal le legislative priorities is really about bolstering the role of community colleges in workforce development, uh, a key area. As you know, that depending on what state you're working in, uh, because we are serving more students than any other sector in higher education across this country, and certainly in this state, that we want to be able to continue to strengthen the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, that's WIOA, and with that, the national economy, uh, by bolstering the role of community colleges in the federal workforce development system. Lots of money floating around these days based on some legislation passed by President Biden in the Congress uh, that the opportunity for us to be guaranteed a leadership role, a leadership apparatus for workforce development at both the state and the local levels. And this is really about making sure that students have a credential, whether that be a certificate or an associate's degree, uh, and being able to streamline how we report that through the WIOA Act. And the idea behind this is giving students an opportunity to have a pathway to a good job, and that those training opportunities, whether they're credit or non-credit, should be provided to our students. Many, many states support both the credit and the non-credit aspect of community colleges. In Massachusetts, our non-credit is almost completely done through grants and self-sustaining efforts here at the college, but still a critically important part of what we're doing and what we're trying to move at the state level. We want to make sure that they continue to fund key education and workforce programs. Uh, we've talked with our Congress folks about reauthorizing or bringing back the Trade Adjustment Assistance Community College and Career Training Program, or TACT. For those of you who may remember, our cybersecurity program was founded on TACT money from the federal government. Our lab science program, medical lab science program, was funded by initially TACT funds in terms of that laboratory and all of the equipment and even our opportunity to hire new faculty for those programs as well. So this opportunity, the Trade Adjustment Assistance Community College and Career Training Program is significant in credential attainment and job placement, uh, but is really working on the skills gaps that would still persist out there in the country. Um, what we're hoping is that Congress can reauthorize or bring back and re the TAC program itself along with WIOA funding to really put community colleges front and center in solving some of the economic development issues at the federal level. When we talk about uh, key education and workforce programs, we're also talking about supporting student access and success, that we wanna boost the Pell Grant maximum award uh, at a minimum each year by an inflationary adjustment and set long-term goals to double the Pell Grant from the 21-22 award year. So it's a big ask around Pell. Pell grants really obviously know are key to all of our students, specifically low-income community college students, pay tuition and fees and meet other college expenses. It's the foundation of student aid. Uh, increasing that maximum award pr promotes both affordability and student success and access for low-income students while significantly reducing their need to borrow. So the more money that goes into Pell, the more we can award to our students. And soon we'll see that there'll be a state metric about that financial aid and the awarding of financial aid in the future. Funding increases should also be provided for a lot of key financing and student support programs, such as the Supplemental Education Opportunity Grant, SEOG, Federal Work Study, which we know is so important to our students in connecting to the institution, our programs that are exceptional at the federal level, but most importantly, our local programs in TRIO, in Gear Up. Uh, some of the best federal money we could possibly spend is on those kinds of programs, providing access to students. Child care access means programs in schools or C campus, post-secondary student success, and basic needs for post-secondary students programs. This conversation about basic needs for students and mental health came up many times during our visit, but we want to make sure that we continue to fund those programs. 
with the debt ceiling and what's happening at the federal level and the discussion about how that's going to play out in terms of the federal budget, every time that we put the debt ceiling, we have this issue that happens politically between Republicans and Democrats, uh, the issue of the debt ceiling creates a problem. Oftentimes, if we don't solve that at the federal level, we now have to figure out how do we continue to finance some of these programs locally until that debt ceiling is resolved. And so when we are at a time when I believe, and I would have never believed this, that SEOG, TRIO, Gear Up, and some of these other programs were ever at risk, we can't take the chance that they will not be refunded. So we have to continue to advocate for them. Uh, strengthen under-resourced institutions. Want to go back one slide, please? Strengthen under-resourced institutions, which is really uh, minority-serving institutions or MSIs, Title IIA strengthening institutions, strengthening historically Black colleges and universities or HBCUs, Hispanic-serving institutions, HSIs, tribal colleges and other programs. We are the recipient of tremendous federal support through Anapesi for our uh, Asian Pacific Islander students, and it is really important that as an emerging Hispanic institution that we continue to advocate for those institutions that are serving the populations that need the service the most, and that we want to make sure that we reduce achievement gaps at community colleges, and so continue to strengthen under-resourced institutions, uh, such as the ones I've mentioned, are really important. Again, we want to make sure that we continue the job training and career and technical education and that means that there are a lot of in-demand jobs out there, increasing funding for strengthening community college training grants. That's through the Department of Labor, now entering its fourth year. We've been the recipient of several of those dollars. We want to make sure that we can enhance funding for Perkins and technical education, which is certainly part of the work that we do here. Adult basic ed and literacy education for state grants. Uh, state grants under the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Grant, WIOA, and the National Science Foundation, Advanced Technological Education, ATE. All of those programs start at the federal level and are then then dispersed by the states. So they're critically important to the work that we do every, way, every day at the college. We need to continue to support DREAMers, even though it's a dream to think that this particular Congress will pass and enact the DREAM Act uh, once and for all giving DREAMers permanent legal status. The DREAM Act provides a path to citizenship for undocumented young people, including the thousands of students that are currently enrolled in the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals or the DACA program. So DREAMers were brought to the United States as minors and frequently know no other nation in no other country besides America. More importantly, they make significant contributions to the US economy and society, DREAMers should be able to access Title IV funding and student aid. And the DREAM Act has been traditionally garnered by bipartisan support and work towards this goal is going to continue to be important. When we were down in D.C., uh, we had some DREAMers with us that were talking to our legislators to explain exactly what they are doing to contribute to the local economy and how difficult it is for them to receive aid and for them to even know or plan what their next step is along their journey here within our nation because the DREAM Act has not been enacted. So that was an important part of our conversation with our legislators while we were there. The last is this uh, part about reforming student aid for today's students, uh, the idea of Pell Grant for students in short-term programs. So a lot of students that are in certificate programs or training programs cannot access Pell dollars. And so it's really important because of the, the, the cost of those programs, community colleges support lowering the threshold for Pell Grant eligibility to 150 clock hours is in the JOBS Act and the Pell Act. So some of our programs here at the college are supported by Pell and some of our short-term programs are not. A lot of conversations locally have been around our efforts with enrollment with micro-credentials. This is all about how do we make sure that Pell Grants can find the ability to expand that program to do short-term programs. We also know that we need to, and we, a, and we can move to the next slide, invest in basic need for all of our students. Uh, the work that Jonathan and all the people in student affairs and across the campus we do is that we wanna make sure that if we're going to uh, engage these students in higher education, that the needs of these students by providing greater access to basic needs services is critical. 
Title IV assistance is rarely generous enough to cover all the necessities. So even if somebody gets a Pell Grant and an SEOG and some local funds, they still have to struggle with food and housing and transportation and childcare and medical expenses. A lot of community college students are still struggling with that because we have not addressed the basic needs of the whole student. So what we're asking is increase the capacity of community colleges to connect with students with supported services. There is a promising new basic needs and post-secondary student success program that's tackling some of these issues and those programs should be greatly expanded. Title IV student aid programs can also be better integrated with income maintenance programs. And we want to strengthen those federal programs, including the child care access means parents in school, C campus, and supplemental nutrition assistance program. Many of you have heard of it as SNAP that will really help our students' true needs. We want to make sure that we continue in the state of Massachusetts a required health care but healthcare isn't required for part-time students, but making sure they have access to good affordable healthcare for low-income individuals is part of what can help them be more successful in college. We also wanna make sure that we allow for responsible borrowing loans, so support uh, financial literacy as we do at the college, tying borrow limits to enrollment intensity, limiting part-time students to prorated debt, that can help students manage their debt and understand that when they take out a loan, that that program completion and decrease the likelihood of facing difficulties in repayment is all about them getting into the workforce. So this issue of loans is not an issue that is a predominant issue at Middlesex Community College. We are still affordable enough and generous enough, both in our state aid and our local aid through the foundation, through scholarships, and through money that has been set aside for local funds to be able to close the gap for most students. But still, some of our students do borrow. And if they do, they need to be responsible for that so they do not end up in debt. And we need to utilize accountability and transparency policies that reflect the needs of students. So we have often advocated for sort of a federal student unit record to generate accurate, meaningful student level data on post-secondary outcomes. We have a really hard time advocating for what we do at community colleges because we can't talk about those outcomes on a federal level, including post-completion earnings. What do students earn when they leave the institution? Not just So we want to ensure that default rates or loan-driven accountability reflect the kind of student borrowing and the student body generally. And the proposals that have been presented before Congress will provide some level of accountability and transparency in creating a system that is responsible and responsive to the community college mission while we make sure that we maintain integrity in a lot of student aid programs. The area around focused student tax policy on those who can benefit most, uh, this one will probably blow you away, make Pell Grants tax-free. So this, the federal government gives Pell Grants to students and then under the current law, community college students must pay taxes on any portion of their Pell Grant that is not used to help meet living expenses. And so in essence, if a student has $400 or $500 or $600 left over from their Pell Grant and it goes back out to them in a check, that's taxable income for the student. Ridiculous. So we're talking a lot about altering the 2500 American Opportunity Tax Credit so that the Pell Grant awards are not subtracted from a student's eligible expenses would dramatically enhance the ability of low-income students to qualify for this credit. So we're talking about an additional on top of not taxing Pell, but doing more with the AOTC so that it helped thousands of community college students receive the maximum credit of $2,500 each year. And this is part of what's happened with the Tax-Free Pell Grant Act, which has been had bipartisan support uh, for a while now. Uh, but we really believe that legislation could be enacted in the 118th Congress. This Congress may actually finally, finally understand just how ridiculous it is to tax Pell. The last is something called the Farm Bill, uh, when it really is most important to us. We are not a rural community college, but really your rural economic development is so critical to many other states. Uh, we had a chance to hear from the Secretary of Agriculture and the Secretary of Transportation uh, while we were in D.C., talking about some new and exciting programs that could really help workforce development in lots of states, but sort of the food shortage that we see that's coming in terms of the 
depletion of farms across our country, but most importantly under this piece is the increase in access to SNAP. So what we want to do is make it easier for students to apply for SNAP, to use their SNAP benefits at the community college and create is, get rid of creating all the bureaucratic barriers that end up uh, keeping a student. And there's a stigma involved in this that needs to be addressed as well. So increasing access to SNAP by creating clear information about why SNAP is so important and why so many of our students can benefit from those kinds of basic needs partnerships with the federal government. The next area is to really talk about what we can do at the state level. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of conversation that's going on at the state level about free community college. We'll certainly talk about that in this, but also I want to talk a little bit about Mass Reconnect, which is a program that the presidents have put together to speak with Governor Healy about. But the most important thing is that as we look at budget priorities for this year, we know the Cherish Act and the funding that will come in through that, plus what's the money that's available in the state coffers at this point, is so critically important to us advocating at this particular time for what we need to run the community colleges and to make them as debt free, both for us and for the students going forward. So we've talked about direct appropriations representing the baseline of our funding for all 15 of the community colleges and incremental costs for collective bargaining agreements are so important. We've done some remarkable work with the collective bargaining agreements. We've started on the road to really help support increasing funding uh, for those collective bargaining agreements. So formula funding is based on performance and enrollment with the goal of sort of equalizing funding dollars across the institutions, but incentivizing the productions of certificate and degrees. We're not afraid of that. We do that already. So these dollars are really the backbone of the college operations. And what we're looking for is additional dollars to be able to do that. Uh, and we've been successful with minor moves in terms of direct appropriation and formula funding. But this is a critical year for us to be able to move the needle on that because of what's available to us in terms of state funding. The success program that you have heard time again, and this is what it stands for for those who don't remember, supporting urgent community college equity through student services, the success fund, which is really money that's been legislated, it's not a grant, was created in, uh, in fiscal year 21, specifically for community colleges in Massachusetts to invest in all the wraparound supports and services using proving, proven models to improve outcomes for students, much like what we use in our TRIO program, in our gear up programs, and those federal dollars have given us great access to create amazing programs to support students. The success funding is to really sort of mirror that and to capture some of our populations that are not as successful, that we have real achievement gaps. And that's our African-American population, our Hispanic population, our LGBTQ population, uh, to allow the colleges to build capacity to support our most vulnerable student population. So at the state level, we're gonna continue to ask for additional monies for the success money to be able to support a number of staff positions in mentorship, in financial literacy, in wellness, uh, all of that is tied to these success funds, a critical component of our ask of the state legislature. Discussion about free community colleges, you haven't missed it. Uh, the uh, Senate President Spilka has indicated that free community college for all will be part of uh, the student opportunity plan. Uh, that's going to be an ongoing conversation. We are working on data every single day, both collectively within the 15 community colleges and individually to give uh, a sense of what it would cost, what the real cost would be for free community college. As I told many people, uh, the Senate president has identified $50 million as a price tag for this. We know that the actual cost is closer to $150 million. And so we have a lot of discussion to go forward to be able to ever meet the goal of free community college in Massachusetts. But the presidents over their retreat uh, this last summer in June, uh, put together a proposal for uh, a commitment that's been made in two or three other states, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Michigan primarily. Uh, this would be called the Mass Connect, Mass Reconnect program. And it's the idea of there are probably close to a half or three quarters of a million of people in the Massachusetts state 
that have no credential. They're carrying around credits, but they've never completed a certificate or an associate. They're usually 25 years or older. They've not earned a college credential yet. So they are oftentimes people who are carrying around college debt, but they also do not necessarily have the upward mobility based on what would be provided from a certificate completion or associate's degree. So that mass reconnect program that we've articulated is part of what we challenge the governor about in terms of last dollar financial support for grants and scholarships. Uh, the idea of significant leveraging the existing financial aid that's available for students, both on the federal and the state level, but to also provide additional financial support to residents of Massachusetts over the age of 25 who need to complete a credential. Um, the early college and dual enrollment is one that we've talked about as uh, uh, something that the governor has identified through a consultant to be able to articulate a highly effective and evidence-based strategy for increasing college attainment and decreasing post-secondary equity gaps. So first, our early college addresses really critical issues, college affordability and success, racial and economic equity, and of course, workforce development. Uh, so we've talked a lot about increasing both the line items for early college. Those are specialized programs that we must apply and be approved for. Uh, we currently have a couple of those that are critical, one with Lowell High School, one with Neshoba Valley Tech. And increasing those, enroll those early college dollars would allow us to partner with additional high schools that are interested in closing their opportunity gaps through this specialized early college process and program. Then, of course, increasing the dual enrollment funds that come from the college and subsidies that increase. So at this point, we know that dual enrollment credits uh, are usually paid at approximately 50% of what any other student would, char would be paying. So at 252 a credit for our regular students and our dual enrollment students at 126 a credit. We're also talking about the payback from the state for our early college programs and increasing that to at least $150 a credit. That's not going to be enough. So we're doing a lot of advocacy about getting that to a more realistic figure of closer to $300 and $350 a credit. So a lot of work around the governor and the new governor seems to embrace early college and dual enrollment. We are already well down that track. So the idea is how do we continue to fund that and how do they pay the colleges for the work that they are doing? The last is a focus that really is a challenge at a lot of community colleges in Massachusetts. We do a limited number of workforce, what would be considered workforce development programs, but we really occupy a pretty unique space in the expansion and growth of the Commonwealth's workforce. Sometimes our students will transfer and get a degree, but oftentimes our students are leaving directly from this institution when moving directly into the workforce. So we wanna to continue to strongly advocate for a lot of programs that have helped to drive the state's workforce, including one program called Training Resources and Internship Network, the TRAIN grant program, which we have participated in out of our corporate and community ed area. It implements training programs for long-term unemployed at community colleges. So we wanna be the place for those students and those people, those citizens who are dealing with unemployment or uh, want to upskill, that they can come to an institution and use the TRAIN grant program to be able to support their additional education. The Community College Workforce Training Incentive Grant, which funds the design of customized workforce training initiatives for local business and industry. We wanna to continue to make sure that we do that. We do literally thousands of dollars in that kind of business with all of our local businesses and also the EEC provider opportunities, which uh, invest heavily in professional development and higher education opportunities to support early educators. Um, we know that childcare and early educators are an underpaid workforce. We wanna make sure that we not only can support the development of professionals in that area that can best serve our most vulnerable and youngest students to be able to prepare them for going to school. And EEC continues to do that. The education and training funds for high demand workforce training programs align with our regional blueprint uh, fields that include things like healthcare, education, manufacturing, IT, cybersecurity. We wanna continue to advocate to receive those training dollars 
to be able to not have to continue to apply over and over again for grants through a process that is cumbersome and challenging because we do not have enough folks in our own grant writing area to keep up the pace of what's happening with these grants. We should be a first choice provider at community colleges for training and education through our workforce and our mass hire fund. So workforce development is a critical component of that. And then some of these would include some other areas that we've done and been successful in before, the STEM Starter Academy, uh, the Higher Education Collaboration and Efficiency Pace, uh, the TRAIN initiative already mentioned. So some of these things are reiterations from previous budgets, but again, asking for increased dollars as we deal with the increases in inflation and also the increased number of people that need our support at a community college level. Next slide. So we have a number of people. Are, we need to focus our area on the Joint Committee on Higher Education. Uh, you'll note that the people who are asterisk here are all in our area, but this is a critical area of how things will be voted on in terms of how the CHERISH Act will be used and some of the other state priorities that I've just mentioned to you, such as direct appropriation, formula funding, success, free community college, mass reconnect, early college, all of the workforce programs, these folks are critically important members of the Senate and the House who will assist us. And several of them, we have ongoing relationships. Senator Eddie Kennedy is there, Representative Rodney Elliott, just newly elected, uh, Representative Raddy Mom, who is the dean of the delegation now, really important for us to stay connected. And in fact, we will be meeting and having a legislative breakfast in another week or so to be able to articulate for these particular representatives what we need from the state budget as the governor's budget comes out very shortly in the beginning of March. Next slide. So this is our, these are the folks that we work directly and develop relationships with each of them uh, and includes Representative Vanna Howard, Raddy Mom that I've mentioned, Rodney Elliott, Senator Edward Kennedy. We'll be meeting with all of those folks early next week and also including our connection with Bedford, Senator Mike Barrett and Representative Ken Gordon. Uh, Ken's son is actually attending the college at this point. So lots of critical relationship building that has had to happen over the course of the last 18 months between the president's office. Uh, I'm very grateful from the assistance that I receive, uh, not only from our external affairs area, but from all of you. Oftentimes you're called upon to step in to assist us with a grant program, to assist with something that one of these folks have identified for one of their constituency. Our responsiveness really helps develop the kind of relationship where they will be responsive with us. So these are the folks that are important to hear from us on a regular basis, certainly from me, but many of you at the college as well. I think at this point, after a lot of information, I wanna turn the program over to our partners in MCCC, uh, who are working very hard to establish and at Higher Ed Advocacy Day, uh, we will hopefully have students and professional staff and administrators and faculty engaged in working with and talking directly with our legislators. That's coming up soon. So I wanna turn it over uh, to Joe Nardoni who has some information for you uh, and a plea for you to be involved and to support all of our efforts to be advocates for the work that we need here within the state for community colleges, but most importantly for Middlesex. Joe. Thank you, Phil. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I want to start off by asking you a question. Those of you who are in the MCCC, uh, please respond with your little uh, raise your hand. How many of you have seen the message that has been put out by Joanna about Higher Education Advocacy Day? Okay, any more? <laughs> Thanks for reading. <laughs> Thanks for reading, I appreciate that. Right, okay, uh, now then, uh, I sure would like to see a lot more of your names on the list that I have from the MCCC saying that you're going, all right? Uh, and I think it's really important because I want you to know some things that are going on there. That's 
that advocacy day is going to be an opportunity for us to directly uh, talk with some of those representatives that were just posted on the screen by Phil. And I think it's really important that, uh, that we get to them on multiple, in multiple ways. Uh, and that we get to them at multiple times because it takes multiple messages to actually end up changing someone's mind to actually do the thing that we need them to do. Now, uh, how many of you who are here today, everybody please answer this question. How many of you actually voted in favor of the fair share amendment? Are we supposed to say that? Well, I think it's okay. I'm asking. Okay. That. Yeah. They don't want to tell me it's okay, but, but you know. You feel comfortable. Right. Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to put you, you know, into a, uh, into a uh, bad spot. See, you guys are going to see all your hands raising up and you won't see mine because I no longer live in Massachusetts. So I couldn't vote for it. All right. <laughs> So the reason I'm asking you for, for, to, to do this is because one of the things that's really super important about that fair share amendment is that we did something that no other state in the entire country has ever been able to do, which is we have passed a progressive tax that focuses on folks who are the mega wealthy. We've been the first state that's done it, and that gives us a once in a generation opportunity to do something about it. And that's called the Cherish Act, which has been rewritten and it's much more detailed and much more powerfully investing, uh, called for much more powerful investing investment in higher education uh, in Massachusetts. And so I just wanna tell you some things about it that it's going to do, all right? Uh, it'll create, uh, it, all right, basically the CHERISH Act is gonna do several things that I think are super important for community colleges. Uh, one is it's going to create a debt-free scholarship program. And that debt-free scholarship program is really designed to kind of bridge those gaps that Phil talked about earlier between those students who have been fully supported and those students who haven't been fully supported when they come, uh, when they come to college. And that's really, I think everybody here who's who's interacted either with a professional staff member, a faculty member, or as a support person in any way, shape, or form, uh, understands that our students, you know, too many of our students go hungry, too many of our students don't have housing security. This, when it's effectuated in a proper manner, is absolutely going to help our students do that. All right. Uh, it's going to set up a public college and university capital debt relief fund. I don't know how much that will really affect folks here at Middlesex, but I do know that folks out at STIC uh, have $300 million of, uh, of deferred maintenance that really needs to happen. And I also know that at Cape Cod Community College, they had a building that was growing mushrooms in it. All right. These are not healthy places for people to go to school and, and learn at, and that needs to be taken care of. Uh, section six of that chapter, of, uh, of the CHERISH Act is going to do something really important for us. Uh, it's going to be something, it, this follows up with what Phil said about making sure that the incremental increases uh, in collective bargaining agreements are actually put in the governor's budget and it mandates that she do that, okay? So that they become part of the governor's budget right from the start so that those costs aren't passed on to uh, the colleges. And you can imagine how uh, how a hit like that just adds to the budget and that requires the colleges to do things like raise tuition and fees. This will definitely help our colleges not have to do that. It's also going to do something else and that's what it's going to do. It's going to make it possible for part-time faculty and professional staff to get wage equity with full-time faculty and professional staff and it's going to give them access to health insurance as well as you know, reasonable pension plans, either the ORP or the state pension plan as, you know, as may be, if, you know, appropriate for the given uh, part-time individual. All right. Uh, and on top of that, it's going to mandate that all of this stuff is paid by the state and not by the colleges, because right now the colleges have to pay a lot of those benefit costs. Another thing it's going to do is it's going to set up a higher, a public higher education wage equity and working conditions commission. And what this commission is going to be charged with is taking a look at how 
people across all of the different segments of public higher education are funded in relation to one are, are paid in relation to one another and compare them to other states. I know a lot of you have seen the uh, graph that the MCCC put out demonstrating uh, exactly how far behind the state of California we are. And I don't think we can ever say this enough. Uh, we are $32,000 a year in average salary behind uh, California when we have nearly identical costs of living. Uh, that same amount of money, if we got that same amount of money, would actually also put us in current equity with A at UMass, which is where we should be. All right. So I think it's really important that we uh, that we kind of support this bill just for those couple of things here. All right. It's going to let's see what else. It's going to make sure that uh, the cost of construction of new buildings at public higher ed campuses does not fall on the colleges to uh, to pay for. That's going to be paid for directly out of the state budget because you know some colleges uh, have up to let's say two thousand five hundred dollars a year in tuition and fees that the students have to pay for. That's really just covering the debt on those things. So I think it's really important that we take care of that. Let's see what. Else. Okay, one thing that I think is super important about the Cherish Act is that the deadlines assessed or given to the various commissions that are set up to do the work in the Cherish Act are meant to be met quickly. We all know how difficult it is sometimes to get state you know, commissions to actually act and do stuff, but all of, act, and actually do their duty, but all of the commissions set up here, except for the green buildings one, because that's gonna be a long-term kind of program, but the things like the wage equity, things like uh, establishing the debt-free scholarship program, those things are meant to be pulled together within a year after the passage of the act. Okay, so that's that's significant. If anybody was here as I was when the NCCC first did their uh, classification study way back around 1998, 99, 2000, it took us three or four years to get that done. Right? Cherish Act will make sure that this happens sooner so that we get our equity and equitable salary much sooner. And it also will say that, you know, there's got to be a five year schedule for making sure how all of this stuff is going to be funded. Let's see. I'm sure I didn't miss anything. Okay, I think I've gone through uh, the sections that I think absolutely uh, make the most important, uh, will have the most important effects and positive effects on us as an institution. And I think it's really important to know that these commissions that are being set up, they're going to have community college representation on it. Somebody from the NCCC is gonna be on each one of those committees. And I think it's really important that we, uh, make sure that we get the right folks from our union to represent uh, our needs at the community colleges on those commissions. So I hope uh, you will become as informed as possible, each one of you about who is in the NCCC, each one of you about what's going on and how to take care of these difficult uh, issues that the Cherish Act is designed to. to Joe, there with. isn't one single part of all of the benefits of the Cherish Act that will not directly impact us, including the deferred maintenance of which the college has $90 million in deferred maintenance. And we receive about $8, eight million every three years. And that's just recently that that has started. And that's for small projects. We will never ever be able to catch up with the deferred maintenance. And that's why we're doing our master facilities plan. So every single part of what Joe has articulated about the Cheris Act is true and will directly impact all of us here at Middlesex. Right, so this is this is the pitch. Uh, we have a once in a generation opportunity to make some change. I'm asking every one of you, those of you who thought, oh no, I can't do that. I've got a test on that day. Let's say you're a faculty member. Shift the test day, go to higher ed advocacy day. How many of your students are gonna complain about having one more day to study before that test. I can't think of a single one. All right, there might be a couple because they're, they're the ones who are always ready, right? So 
right? But, you know, for your professional staff members, uh, you know, ask your supervisor. Ask your supervisor, get clearance, come on down. We want to have enough people down there. I mean, literally, I want the intimacy to have more people down there than any other segment of public higher education. Why? Because we serve the most students, right? One of the cool things in the Cherish Act is that it's going to give $2,000 per student for support for the things like the success program and the other kinds of supports that Bill was talking about. When you take a look at the fact that we have nearly 70,000 students at the community colleges, that's going to mean approximately 140 million additional dollars coming into the community colleges to actually help those students get the support services they need so that you know that when you're, one of your students is having trouble with the kinds of things that these support services are supposed to uh, give for them, there'll be some place and there'll be people here staffed ready to go and help them. All right. Uh, thank you, Joanna. That's really important uh, in the chat. I think it's super important that you know that you don't have to drive down to Boston yourself. If you're like me, and I truly hate to drive in Boston, I really do. In fact, when I go down there as part of my duties for the MCCC, what do I do? I take the train from, <laughs> I take the train in and then uh, use the subway when I'm there and I come back on the train. Uh, why? Because I just don't like driving in Boston. So if you're one of those folks, we're gonna have some buses, all right? We're gonna have a couple of vans, at least one at Lowell and one in Bedford. At least that's the way we're planning it. So please, please, absolutely sign up. In fact, I would say take the time right now to go ahead and sign up. Uh, Phil, can you give me uh, the opportunity to share a screen? Could you post uh, that in the chat, Joe? Yep. Uh, uh, I will post this, I will post oh. something on the screen. There we go. Give me the chance to share the screen and I'll show it to you. While you're getting that ready, let me just say, we had a Macer meeting. I don't know, I can't see Mary, but I know she's here in spirit somewhere. Um, <laughs> we had a Macer meeting with the whole team, Mary, Arlene, uh, Marielle, Stacy, Sally, Quast, and myself. Um, and as part of our regular conversation, I asked about Advocacy Day and about how professional staff and faculty might be able to attend and not have to utilize their own personal accrued time. This is bigger than a union issue. This is a full college, full community college system issue of funding. And so in, in concert with um, President Sisson and the Macer team and HR, uh, the college will allow you to attend this day without any loss of personal accrued time. So on your timesheet, it will just look like regular. However, you have the responsibility to have a discussion with your supervisor in your department to make sure it's okay. Can't have everybody go to the state house. That would be awesome, uh, but we can't have everybody go. So if it's possible for you, if it's a little bit of a slower day, if you think you'd like to be there to advocate and uh, talk to some of our reps, that'd be great. I know there are students attending from Middlesex. Uh, as Joe said, for faculty members, we generally have a little bit more flexibility, however, you want to talk to your department chair or dean and say, how can I, I'd like to attend, but I have class that day. What are my options, right? So maybe you can post a video lecture. Maybe you can give an assignment or do something else for the students so that you're able to attend. In fact, maybe you should encourage your students to attend that day as well. And we are going to provide transportation from the college. Thanks to Pat Cook and his area, Dan Martin. Um, and I believe students and employees will be uh, writing together. So Joe's got the flyer up there. I know I have sent this out to MCCC members. Of course, this could be available to anybody. Just ping me. I'll send you the information. I'm going to resend the email that I sent out. Hmm, I don't know if it was last week or the week before. If you can't attend the day, you can absolutely call your representatives, whether in the Senate or the House in your area. We have lists of people. Uh, in the email, there are links to find out who it is in your area that would be your representative if you live in Massachusetts and you can reach out, there's even a script. Right. Uh, thank you, Joanna. And for those of you who have your cell phones handy, you know, just take it, take a look and put it right over the, the QR code and you can sign up right here, right now. Make the decision now, make the determination now that you are gonna do the one thing that's gonna help your students almost as much as your own teaching 
or support staff services is going to do, which is to actually make sure that there's more money coming into our college so that our students are better supported and so that you get the compensation that you deserve to get for doing the hard work that you're doing. I mean, this is just like, this is so important. I can't think of a single reason not to do this, even if you have a test plan for that day. Reschedule the test. I know it sounds so hard, and I understand exactly how difficult it is to change a syllabus, because my gosh, I've done it at least 50 times since I've been here as a professor at Middlesex. At least 50 times I've had to change my syllabus, so I know exactly how hard it is. But my gosh, this is the one time that we have to make a gigantic difference, and to make a gigantic difference that's going to last. Because when we get the Cherish Act passed, that's not going to be very easy for the legislature to turn it back. Well, thank you, Joe and, and, and Joanna. I want to thank you both, both for your passion and for your dedication to this work. And clearly, uh, this afternoon's critical conversation is to answer your questions about any of the items that we've brought up, uh, clarify anything in terms of some of the funding requests, but most importantly for you to understand what Joe has already said beautifully is that we are at a pretty critical time in Massachusetts history and in the college's history. Um, we know that we are underfunded and have been for years. We know that faculty and professional staff and, the cert and AFSCME folks are all underpaid. We know that there is an opportunity here to capitalize on a legislative push to be able to uh, bring forward what has been talked as the Cherish Act, the Millionaires Act, whatever people have called it before, but that this feels a little bit like a telethon uh, and, and we'll, we'll, that's important, but I think really to do whatever you can do uh, to be able to support this, to have your voice heard. Uh, I also want to mention to all of you that your visibility uh, is really important as we continue to reach out to our legislators, uh, just so that for those of you who are not aware, uh, the renovations are happening to the Lowell kitchen to turn it into a teaching kitchen. That is happening because of an earmark we were able to secure from Senator Kennedy for $60,000. Um, Kim Morrissey and Judy Hogan did an amazing job of executing this but it's this kind of outreach to our representatives at the state level that brings attention to the great work that's being done at Middlesex. I mean, I can do that and I do that every day, but most importantly, all of you can do that at an advocacy day as well. I also want you to know that in a week, uh, Congressman Moulton will be coming to Bedford to highlight all the amazing work that we do with our biotech program and the opportunity to help execute sort of the expansion of that biotech program into our Bedford campus uh, and an opportunity that we're raising money to be able to do that, to create a new facility and new laboratories there to reach out to all of the biotech companies down in the Southern part of the Middlesex Three Coalition, uh, specifically Ultragenics and a number of others, uh, but you know, well over $300,000 from Congressman Moulton for all the equipment for those labs. These kinds of conversations, this direct outreach to legislators makes a difference. And so, you know, join us as we have joined together to really support the work of the college going forward. And at this point, I'll open it up to questions or comments that any of you may have, and I'll turn it over to Beth to help facilitate that. Thank you, Phil. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to raise your hand with your little emoji icon and we will call on you. Uh, also, if you are more comfortable, you can just put it into the chat uh, and I will read them aloud. Thanks, Beth. And for those of you that might have missed it, Joanna put some information into the chat um, regarding MCCC. Actually, anybody can let me know if they want to go. It's not just union members and you know so students will be on the buses so if anybody wants to go uh part of the reason I'd like to know because MTA requires a sign up so they're really the great organizers of this whole day Middlesex has a little bit of a different spin on how we're going to handle it but we'd like to know who's going hopefully we'll be able to pair up employees with students um, and have the double barrel hit of you know the student story and the employee story and how we serve the students 
and how we're so grossly underpaid. It's a two-pronged approach, trying to get money for MCCC members and MTA members and um, in general, and how to get money for students, how to make their education affordable. I'm gonna also mention that if you do go down with us to Higher Education Advocacy Day, I remember you're going into the state house, so you're going to have to go through much like what you go through in TA uh, security, TSA security. So, you know, avoid a lot of metal, uh, avoid carrying a lot of stuff uh, with you. Uh, travel light that day and it will serve you well uh, and comfortable shoes for an opportunity to make a couple of office visits with us would be great. So um, please come prepared uh, to fully participate in the day if you can. And when you get there, if you're not coming with uh, with the college, if you're coming on your own, know that the gate that you can get in through is the general hooker gate, okay? Right now, that's the only one you can get into because they're, they're, they're working on the others. So uh, that's the, the entry in, and that's the one that faces Boston Common. And we will be meeting in room 428. And it goes from 10.30 to 2.30. 10.30, we'll start with a press conference and then uh, with you know, a several, with a select panel of speakers. And then there will also be uh, the direct lobbying for the folks uh, around our campus. No questions, no questions about logistics, about any of the sort of data that we share with you on the federal and the state level. Um, like I said, we, we're very fortunate in Massachusetts to have excellent federal representatives who are very supportive of our work that we talk to on a regular basis. Um, but you know, this is a real opportunity at the state level for us to be able to impact the college's budget. So those asks are uh, are modest. You know, we we have learned to to uh, rub two nickels together and survive and create excellence every single day. Uh, this is a chance for us to take it to the next level. And um, yep, somebody's asked that we put the flyer in newscaster. Yep, that must be a Joanna. Yep, that, that can be done. Is that Beth, are you seeing any other questions or comments that we need to cover? Uh, no questions. Uh, Marilyn Glazer Wisner did make a comment um, that. Uh, let me, it's, it's long, but I'll read it one second. Um, serving as an advocate can happen at any time. Luckily in my town, there was a Democrat committee that hosted on Zoom Sundays with the candidates. I attended every single session. All of the candidates listened to me talk about the disparity in funding for community colleges and the disparity in services for community college students across the state. Fantastic. Nice. Again, folks, if you could um, think about this and make your arrangements and let me know by Friday so I can coordinate with Patrick and Dan and their team for transportation. Uh, I will send out additional information to members today. Um, again, the flyer will, Joe, can you, we want to put that, send that so that can get put on um, Newscaster. And I just want to reiterate that, you know, the college remains open. We're here to serve students on, on that day as well. Uh, we'd love as many of you to participate as you possibly can, uh, but at the same time, we want to make sure that you communicate clearly with your manager and that you are registered and on the list to participate so that we can make sure that um, your timesheet is not inappropriately docked in any way. So we just want to make sure we, we're working in concert here with our MCCC and MTA partners and students and Phenom, which is the student organization that does advocacy across the state and um, so the more we can communicate with each other and make sure we have good plans uh, for that day, the better. Uh, so seeing so I no, have a, I have yeah, a question. Ahead, Beth, I'm sorry, yes. Yep, from um, Sean Kenny. Uh, yep. He has been employed at the college since 2020 and currently works part-time as a success coach for STEM Starter Academy. The funding is contingent upon uh, funding from year to year. During today's presentation, I didn't see that SSA was one of MC MCC's priorities, but I could have missed it if you said that it was verbally. Um, I was wondering if SSA is considered a MCC priority. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. And in fact, what's really, um, SSA has just now reached a threshold in terms of its uh, external report 
in terms of the STEM Starter Academy support that started with the former speaker. Uh, it is uh, a, a it has been for many, many years untouchable, although year to year we continue to advocate for it. That is not listed in that. And what will happen is we're waiting to see um, it, if it were not in the governor's budget on March 1st, we would be shocked, Sean. I mean, so what I would tell you is it's been around for so long and there's been such success from the integration of a number of our students and enticing them into STEM related areas. So the work that the STEM Starter Academy has done has been really important for the state. I cannot imagine it not being part of the governor's benefit. And what I, what I shared with you today is really a draft of the Massachusetts priorities. If we see that something is missing in the governor's first version of the budget, I can assure you that we will be very explicit about STEM starter, about a number of workforce areas such as train, EEC, ETF. So there are a number of programs that are like that um, that we will include in there. But yes, STEM starter academy has been and always will be a priority at the institution and uh, that funding will continue. I, if I had to lay money on anything that was on that list that I shared with you that was sacrosanct, I would say STEM Starter Academy is at the top of that list. Great question. Nothing else in chat, Phil. Excellent. So it's we're going to give you an hour and 56 minutes of your time back today. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Um, these conversations are important for you to know what's happening at the college at multiple levels. But most importantly, the takeaway from today is that you are all advocates for the work that we do here every day, just by your very work that you do. But when we have these critical moments in the history of Massachusetts and in our federal government to be aware, to be informed, to be outspoken, uh, then I hope that you will all join us who have spoken today in doing that. We hope to see you on Advocacy Day. If not, I hope you're picking up the phone to be communicating with your legislators to tell them how important the work that we do here is every day. And the students that we serve are better served by your advocacy in any way that you can do it. So thank you so much for participating today. Uh, and we'll see you again next month.